Um, so, uh, well, thank you everyone for, uh, for signing in this evening. Uh, obviously a massive thank you for, uh, to, to May for being with us. Um, just a few words, a bit of background and a bit of a call for help. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the founder of the London Java community. Uh, I'm not a developer myself. I run a tech recruitment company called RecWorks. Uh, so here at RecWorks, we've been on a mission for, um, for about the last 12 years now to find ways that recruitment can be a force for good in the tech industry beyond just getting people jobs. And that's specifically been around learning, mentoring and, and career development. So what we try and do is create groups and platforms where we connect people that want to share with others that, uh, that, that want to learn. Uh, and that can be on a, on a group basis with events like, like today with May um, and, through, uh, and through the communities like the LJC. Or, or on a one-to-one -one level, which we do uh, more often through the Meet a Mentor community. Um, so as for what I want help with, uh, every second Friday we hold a Lightning Talks event, which I know a few of you have spoken at already. Um, it's part of an aspiring speakers group that we run. Uh, next Friday we are short two speakers, so if there's any, uh, any volunteers, anybody that's interested in speaking, anyone that's happy to speak, what's that, in 10 days' time, um, please let me know. Um, either drop us a, a note on the chat or, or, or through LinkedIn. Uh, it's all and any experience of welcome, by the way. So if we've got experienced speakers or, or, or junior speakers, then, um, then please do come along. Uh, everything we do, though, it's all powered by revenue from recruitment. Uh, so if you're looking to hire any developers in, in London specifically, um, then please do let me know or, or at least bear us in mind when, when it comes up. Uh, anyway, on, on to this evening. Uh, so, so May uh, Baseron is a software engineer, uh, a back-end developer, and a public speaker. Uh, she develops games, speaks at tech conferences, and experiments with algorithms, as well as learning languages such as Scala, Golang, and Russian. Uh, and as you can see behind, she's a little bit partial to a bit of Star Wars. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to, uh, to, to May. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm so excited. Um, usually I talk at conferences with people that are right there in front of me. So if, you know, I made them laugh, I can see them laughing. So if anybody else, I see one, one guy who has his camera, like if anyone's brave enough to also open their camera, I would be so happy. I want to see real people smiling or not, you know, anything. I like reactions. Um, I miss real people. Yay, another camera. Good. Uh, I miss real people. Uh, another camera. Okay, so that's, that's perfect. So if anyone here else is brave enough to open their cameras, uh, we're all at home. We all look like we're working from home. So it's, you know, it's whatever. I mean, I put on lipstick, but okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll start or what do you say? Should I wait a little bit more or I think, our, okay, we're good I to go. You're, you're good to start. Yeah, you're good to go. You're good to go. Perfect. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I can't even contain this excitement, <laughs> but okay, let's do that. Let's, let's do this thing. I'm going to share this screen and... Let's share this one and yeah, share, no, 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 hold on a second and I'll start, that's not what I wanted and let's start the thingy. Okay, uh, just tell me like this if everyone can see the, the presentation, the slide, cool. Yay! All right! Okay, we're ready to start. So, hi everyone again. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining uh, for yet another Zoom meeting. I'm sure that you had enough Zoom meetings today, but uh, you know, deciding to join to another Zoom that, I mean, I, I'm honored, honestly. So, thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how to wrap your imperative mind around uh, functional programming and more specifically uh, in around closure. Um, but before I'll start to talk about that, I will introduce myself a little bit, even though I was introduced, but I guess that's how I start. So my name is May. I'm a software engineer. I'm a backend developer at AppsFire. Um, I'm also a public speaker and I have to say something. I talk a lot. I think you've noticed. I talk a lot, but being a public speaker, it means that I have like a professional title for talking a lot because 
I talk a lot at conferences and in general, so I kind of like it. And yeah, I'm also a sworn Star Wars fan, which basically means that I just buy a lot of stuff, uh, more stuff of Star Wars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so functional programming. Uh, let's read this thing. In computer science, functional programming is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. Thus, this was taken from Wikipedia. This is the definition of functional programming. Um, and then that's it. Thank you guys for joining. I hope you all enjoyed. If you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate. That's it. You know everything you need to know. Okay. Bye. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's it. But uh, this is actually a very good, uh, let's go back there. This is actually a very good um, definition of what is functional programming um, because it is just applying and composing functions. It's functions and more functions and more functions. So it's very accurate, which makes sense because it was on Wikipedia. Um, but I'm not going to only talk about, you know, the general definition of functional programming. What we're going to actually do today is go through this journey that I present to you right here. Before I will dive into each of these um, things that you see over here, let me tell you what I wish that each and every one of you will take away from my talk. I want you to learn about these different concepts. I want you to maybe be inspired to use some of those concepts in other languages that maybe are not necessarily functional uh, per se, but I can say that I've been programming in Clojure as well as other languages, but mainly in Clojure over the past year and a half. And I can tell you that it made me a better developer because getting, in, uh, getting the functional programming way of thinking, the functional paradigm into my mind, this has got me to think through things and you know, write more efficient code and i guess we all aspire to have efficient and good and clean code and i truly believe that these uh these dots that i have over here of the functional programming i honestly believe that this can make you a better developer if you start thinking about these things before you write anything so let's dive deep we're gonna start with talking about how are we going to deal with things when we don't have any objects i mean objects are out so what are we going to have? Then we're going to talk about pure functions. What makes a function um, called you know, pure? Uh, is it possible to have your entire program constructed out of pure functions? Maybe. Do you need to have your entire program constructed out of pure functions? Also, maybe, I don't know. Um, then we will talk about immutability. Let me say this, immutability changes everything. Get it? Get the, did you get the joke? Okay, so immutability changes everything because uh, if you can't change stuff, then what do you do? We have data, we want maybe to edit the data, but do we really want to edit? I don't know, we'll think about it. So then we'll talk about functions as values. What does it mean? How do we use it? How is it useful for us to have that, um, uh, to be able to use functions as values. And then last but not least, we will talk about higher order functions. And maybe you know a few and you're already using them, uh, but you'll see that a little bit later. So by the end of this talk, you will reach the closure star, <laughs> like that star, but I didn't wanna, like, I think you all got the um, Star Wars jokes already. So I'm not gonna, you know, shove it into your face anymore. I promise. No, I don't promise anything. Maybe I'll say a few more Star Wars things later. Okay, let's begin. So I really wanted to be able to talk about functional programming without giving you examples of um, that came from any game that I wrote in Clojure, but I just couldn't avoid it because I love writing games in Clojure. And I honestly think that it will make this talk much more fun. So all of the examples that I'm going to give you today uh, for all of the basics that constructs the functional programming paradigm, all of these examples are taken from code that construct this game. Let's see. It's, um, so this is actually a multiplayer game 
uh, written in Clojure. So the backend is written entirely in Clojure. Um, and as you can see right now, this is just the base, you know, the base of the game. It's what you have over here is just players that are able to move around the screen in four directions, up and down, left and right. And you identify yourself as the self player. If you are the monkey with the, um, with the crown, as you can see, each monkey has, um, an exception like a type of exception. That's why they are called exceptional monkeys. Um, later on, when you will see the next version of the game, uh, every monkey will uh, have to collect exceptions that match his exception. And over there at the top left corner, you can see in the tiny, tiny font that this is the scores um, of each player. But we're not there yet. Right now we have multiple uh, players each one can only move for four directions and literally that's it. So um, what we're going to see, the examples that I'm going to show you um, will actually do this. Uh, it will show you how to add a new player, how to create a new player, how do you handle the state of the player if you know, we're talking about functional programming. Then I will show you an example of moving player and then later we will talk about how do you remove a player from the screen. So, like I said, objects are out. What do we have instead? Key value map. So, what does it mean? If we don't have an object, right? And usually, if you come from an object-oriented uh, programming language, you probably think, okay, if I develop a game, uh, what you will have is an object of a player, right? And then this object of the player will probably have its functions that define the behavior of the player, maybe running, maybe jumping, um, but this is not the case. So how do you define a player? So what you're going to have is actually just a map of key value pairs and that's it. So you can see this map over here and in this map you see that the first key is player question mark and it's set to true and what it means is this key says to me as the reader that um, this map represents a player entity that's it and what you see over here is actually a function written in closure, that's how do you know that? It's because it's the uh, def n that is right there on the side. And then the name of the function, new player, this function actually get, doesn't get anything as an input, but, and it only returns a new map that represents a player. That's it. So we have a player right now and let's continue. So let's talk about pure functions. What, what are they actually? What does it mean? So this is a pure function. When we used to um, learn, you know, back in, in school, if you showed me this, you know, I would completely understand what's going on here. If I will, you know, insert the value two, I will always get the same answer. No matter how many times I will activate this function on the number two, I will always get the same answer. And this is the definition of um, a pure function. A function is considered pure function if it returns the same result given the same arguments. I mean, given the same values as an input. Another thing is a function is considered pure also if it does not cause any observable side effects. And what does it mean does not cause any observable side effects? Let's see. So functions may contain uh, these things like reading files and it can still always return the same result, right? I can just put at the end of the function, uh, return one. It will always return the same result, right? And for the same input, but it is causing side effect. I mean, it's either actually not just reading file, also writing to files because it doesn't matter what the input will be. I might change a file or I might calculate a different value considering what was written in that file. Another thing is random number generation. So if the output is dependent on the number that is returned from this function, 
um, and this number is randomly generated, it's, it's not a pure function anymore. And last, modifying a global object or a parameter passed by reference. That's also a thing. Like if we change, um, you know, if we change a value inside a function and this value was not, I mean, and this variable is not defined inside this function, it's defined somewhere else. Well, we all know it's, it's bad practice, but now you also know that it makes the function um, to be, I mean, not pure. So let's, let's see an um, example in code. Uh, we all recognize what it is, right? This is uh, just calculating the area. Uh, so on the left side, we have the not pure way of writing this uh, uh, function in JavaScript. And then on the right, we have the pure way. And the reason, just like I said, that the one on the left uh, is not pure, it's because we are actually dependent on global variables and for the result of the function. And here's the thing. The thing about pure functions is this. First of all, it's easier to test them, okay? If your function is pure, it's easier to test your function because you know that for a certain input, you will always get the same output. Another thing is that if I use the area function as an API, it means that I, I mean, if I use it in, in the pure way, it means that I can always be sure that my API won't change without me knowing about it, right? But if I'm going to use the one on, on the left and somebody, I don't know, one day decides to be funny and change the value of pi, then it's going to cause me troubles and I might not be even aware of that. So I think you should take this into consideration when you are writing your functions. I honestly believe that you should aspire to write your functions um, in, the, in a pure uh, matter. And it's, although it's not always possible, just keep that in mind. I honestly believe it will make your code better and much easier uh, to test and also easier to maintain. So let's go back to our game. Uh, we already saw the function that returns a new player map and now it's time to move our player. So what you see over here is code written in Clojure back again, uh, like the entire backend of this uh, game. And this function is called move player. And what it does is you know, just like the name, it gets a player map as the first argument. And then we get um, the new X and Y, how much you need to move in the X and then how much you need to move in the Y axis. And then we get the window height and width. Um, what I want you to take away from this function is actually that it's a pure function because we get the input, we calculate, you know, where the player is supposed to be, like what is the new values of the X and the Y of the player. And then we return a new map of the player with, a new with the new values of X and Y. This is what Asos is doing. Asos actually gets a map and gets also these, uh, and also gets values. And it constructs a new map and it returns it as uh, the result of the function. So this is what I'm doing over here. I am not editing um, the player map. I am returning a new one. And this brings me to our next thing, immutability. So when data is immutable, its state cannot change after it's created. If you want to change an immutable object, you can't, that's it. So just like we saw in this example that I showed you, and we will look at this example once again in a little bit, instead of changing the um, object, what you will do is just create a new one with the new values. That's exactly how we will handle the player entity. So let's dig a little deeper into the move player function. What we have over here is the if function because in closure, if uh, is also a function just like, well, literally almost everything else in closure. Uh, so if function, what it gets is, uh, a predicate and it gets, it gets the, what we want to check is if the player is out of boundaries uh, of the window uh, in the width or the height. And then 
Um, if it was, so the first source is what we will return. Um, wait, I think somebody activated their microphone. Okay. So, I'm sorry, somebody activated their microphone and it got me out of uh, concentration. I'll go back to the code. If uh, what we're doing is checking if the player is out of boundaries with the new X and Y. Yeah. So the first SOS that you see over here uh, will be returned in case the player uh, tried to move out of the boundaries of the window. And what we want to return in that uh, specific uh, occasion is the, the, the player map. And I want it to have a new set uh, of value for the collision key. Why? Because I don't want the player to get out of the screen. So I set collision to true. And when I say collision, I mean collision with the boundaries of the window. And then you already know the last line. This is what will happen if there was no collision with the window boundaries. Uh, again, a source returning the player with the new values of X and Y. But what if I need state? Hmm. Sometimes we need state, right? I mean, we need state right now uh, because it's a game. It's a part of the thing to edit a state. Um, and then, you know, we use that, the values of the game. So closure allows that um, because closure is not completely pure uh, functional language. So what I have in this game is the way I keep the state of the game, I keep it in a global variable and it's a player's map. It's constructed out of an atom and it's also a key value map. This map will, of players, it actually holds all of the players that are currently connected to the game. Remember, it's a multiplayer game. So all, all the ones that are currently connected to the game are held in this map of players. And what you see over here is the only function that I have in this game that changes a state, okay? So what I do when I have a, a complete flow and I still need to update something, okay? I still need to update a state of something. Then what I do is I aspire to have most of my functions pure, and then I keep the one that is editing or updating the state of the game at the end of the program. So this way I have, you know, uh, I have a program constructed of many, many, many functional function calls one after another. I know that all of them are like, I feel that they are like some sort of pipe that I'm, you know, moving data between those um, functions. And then only at one end, I will edit whatever it is that I need to edit. And in this case, what we're editing, as you can see, I called it in a very simple name, update players map. So the way I update the players map is by calling swap function and swap actually just takes um, a new uh, value and it changes the value of the player's map. Um, and then that's it. Oh, and then it returns the new value of the player's map. So what I will have in the variable called updaters player map, I will have the new map of players after it's been updated. Uh, later on, it, you can see I'm calling the broadcast message and that's uh, to broadcast the player to all of the screens that are connected, but I'm not going to get into this. I actually did a talk about how I handle the connections. Um, if you want to watch yet another talk about closure, then it's out there. Okay, let's move forward. Exceptional Monkeys Volume 2. So we, up until now, we had the multiple uh, player game uh, where we could only move the player around without, you know, getting any action. So are you ready for action? It's going to be crazy. I promise. Like insane. Okay. Don't get addicted. Okay. I know. I know. It's, it's crazy. Look at this. Boom. That's it. That's, that's the, that's the game. Like he, uh, you can collect exceptions and that's it. <laughs> that's, that's the, 
Isn't it like super fun and you, I know you all can't wait to play that game and like I just knew it's going to be super viral and everything and I had to keep it a secret and you know but oh I have to tell you something okay let's okay I know I know I know we're talking about functional programming but let's let's put this aside and I need to tell you something as a developer two developers like don't don't develop a game or I guess anything with entities that their names are uh, exception names. If the language that you're working with has exceptions in it, because it's gonna cause, <laughs> I'm just gonna say some trouble or a lot of anger or both like trouble and anger. And maybe, I don't know, more anger because if you see in your logs that you have like divide by zero exception and you're like, what, where? And, oh, I created this exception. You're, it's, it's not the best feeling and I don't know, I went with it anyway. So, okay, uh, I don't think I'll ever develop a game any, uh, again, with exceptions as the entities of the game. Yep, I shared this with you. This was, <laughs> this was my moment. Let's go back to talking about functional programming. I hope you're ready. <laughs> So we're gonna talk about the, this, the way that, that the game is right now. And we previously only had, like I said, movement around and you know, adding players. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna show you examples that will actually tell you how to check for a collision and then remove exception from the screen and then edit the player score value. So, okay. The fourth thing is Funds are first class citizens. And what does it mean? So it means that just like any other data type, a function can be, uh, is just treated as a value. Um, it means that functions can be assigned as values, they can be passed into functions, and they can also be returned from functions. And this means that it allows programs to be written in a declarative and composable style. And it means that then I can combine the functions in a modular manner. It means that it's easier for me, you know, to combine the functions and maybe change and edit my program in a very, very easy way because all I have to edit, you know, is the value. Uh, but Let's, let's just see examples. That's way better than just explaining. So let's see an example of how, what it would look like uh, for a function to be assigned as a value. But before we're gonna jump into the um, thing, I want to tell you what this function is doing. Um, so this is the function that shows us how the player collects an entity and our entity, as you remember, is an exception. So that's it. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted, I want you to know that an, okay, an exception will be collected if the exception type matches the player's exception type. Okay, so function assigned as a value. What we see over here is me defining fn, which is a predicate for checking if the exception type the, of the entity matches the exception type of the player. Also, you can see that I'm checking for an overlap between the uh, X and Y of the player and then the X and Y of the um, exception of the entity. So I'm going to take this function that I defined here, this function that I defined, and what you see is that it is being inserted as a value into pred. Pred is just a variable. And now this variable is holding as a value the function that I created over here. What it means is that later on, I can change this function into any other different function that I want. And this, I think, is easier to edit than editing, you know, an if statement that is somewhere thrown inside a huge function. It will be easier for me to find where I want to edit this thing than trying to find an if statement or, or something like that. So I guess this is a great example as to why 
I absolutely love closure because I feel that it's simple after you get over, you know, all of the parentheses. So yeah, that's it. Uh, we have the function get uh, being inserted to pred as a value. Next thing that we're gonna check out is how this function will be passed into another function as a value. That's it. <laughs> you see, we're just taking pred and we're sending that uh, into the filter function. Done. Oh my God, we're getting close to the end. I hope, I hope everyone enjoys. I'm having fun. I don't know. I'm having fun. I hope, I hope you guys enjoy too. So higher order functions. Okay. First, before we talk about higher order functions, let's talk about first order functions. What, what is that? So first order functions is a function that does not take a function as an argument or returns a function as an argument, um, as an output, not an argument. That's it. So a higher order function is a function that will take one or more functions as arguments or it returns a function as its result. So there are these functions that I believe some of you know. Um, this is take, taken from a great, great, great blog post uh, written about JavaScript. And um, I'm going to talk about only the filter function as our example. Um, so I want you just to know that these three functions, the map, the filter, and the reduce, these are higher order functions and they are originated in functional programming, um, but they are so useful. So I know that they are actually copied into languages that are not necessarily functional languages um, because it's just really useful to use them. And what they do, these function, is they get a function as an input and they apply this function to the entire collection. So if I will talk about the filter, over here, what we can understand is filter will apply a function that gets as an input on the array. And if we look at the, you know, fruit example, uh, the, if we apply filter to this example, then it means that we probably had a filter uh, function, filtering function that says return only if this is an orange. And that's what we see as the result. So let's see how it's implemented in the game. That's it, you've already seen it. <laughs> it's just the filter um, the function that is being uh, applied um, to the collectibles, which is the entire list of um, the you know, exceptions that I have. And what it's doing is it's taking pred as the function that it will apply to all of those exceptions. And it makes sense because what I want is to return the collected exception, which means it answers, you know, these uh, two, like either it's, you know, both, not either, it's actually like both if it's the same exception type as the player and also if it overlaps with the X and Ys of the player. And what you can see over here is that the collect function returns collected, which is the entity that was collected and should be removed from the screen. And I just kind of want to add something here. How do I define that the, a certain entity should be removed from the screen? Because I think I skipped that and I didn't say it before. So the way, to, the way that I do it is I just have a key value pair inside the, uh, the map of this entity, which says show and either true or false, and then that's it. And this is how the client will be able to decide whether to show this entity or not. That's the, that's it. So I think it's time ah, to be done. Okay, so let's go through everything we talked about today really, really quick. Um, we talked about what do we do when we don't have objects. So I told you that you can use just uh, maps, uh, key value maps, 
And then you might want to add in like a key that will define what this map describes, like what is the data that is described in, uh, inside this map. Then we talked about pure function and I, functions, and I suggested that you aspire towards writing your functions uh, pure. And I also said that it's okay, sometimes we can't have all of our functions pure because we need observable side effects like reading from files and all the other examples that I gave there. Um, also, I talked about immutability. I told you how it changes everything because you don't edit values. You need to start thinking differently. Like, yeah, if you don't edit a value, it just means that you're going to create a new value instead. And then we talked about functions as values. Uh, and I showed you an, a great example. <laughs> I just said, I showed you a great example. And I mean, it's like, I'm saying that about my example. I hope it was great. I hope you understood the example, you know? So I showed you an example of what it would look like taking a function as a value, because then I sent it into the filter function, which is a higher order function. And I showed you a few of these two. And here we are in closure star. Woo! Um, one more thing before I wrap this up. Uh, this is the entire code of the back end of the game. So this game, like I said, uh, was the back end was written entirely uh, by me and Clojure, but the front end was written by a very dear friend of mine, super talented front end developer. His name is Roy Berkovich. So kudos for Roy for writing the beautiful uh, front end. I, I don't like really, I don't really like front end. So I'm so glad that he did such a good job on that. And this code is out there in my GitHub uh, for you, because this is one of the key takeaways that I want you to take from this talk. I want you to feel free to start experimenting with Clojure and why not do it with a fun, addicting game, the exceptional monkeys game. And then, you know, you're gonna thank me later. <laughs> I make myself laugh sometimes. Okay, last thing. I keep saying last thing, but then there's more and more slides. So I, I think my credibility like is going down, but it's okay. <laughs> so this is another key takeaway. Okay, the first key takeaway was I want you to feel free and to feel, you know, comfortable enough to start experimenting with closure. Uh, and you, I said that you can do it with my game. And then another thing that I want you to take from today is in functional programming, we have functions acting on data and not data activating functions on itself, right? We don't have any object like a player object activating jump function on itself. What we saw is we have like a move function just, you know, calculating the new values on the data that it received as an input. So that's it. <laughs> Dream big and start with tiny steps. And I say that because I think that if you start with a small game or any other small, um, like program written in Clojure or any other language that you've never tried to write in before, uh, I think, it makes it easier and actually much more fun to start uh, programming in a new language this way. I find it easier and more fun to start learning new languages with trying to write something small instead of watching a tutorial or something like that. Because when I get that small win, it's kind of like I want more of that, you know? So that's, that's another thing that I hope you will take from this talk. Um, that's it. I'm dancing here. <laughs> I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, let's see. Oh, there's like stuff in the in the chat. Okay. Um, let's see. I got a. There's a message here. Nice talk. Thanks. Yay. I now want to code a small game enclosure. <gasps> Yay. That's it. Uh, I did my job. That's it. I feel I, that's. I'm so happy right now. Uh, for a special meaning for collectibles. So yeah, let's go back to that. It's actually a good question. I didn't, so I wanna say something. I didn't really go, didn't dive very deep into the closure code um, because 
I had a lot of things that I wanted you to take from this talk, okay? I have other talks about closure and we can talk about it another time. Um, but now that we have still more time, then I can go back into that. So let's talk about it. Okay. So what we see over here, so collectibles is actually uh, an atom. What it means, it's a map uh, that of type atom. And what it means in closure is that it's, I can actually edit it uh, in an atomic way. And when I'm uh, using the at before the collectibles, it means that this is where I want to extract the value of the collectible. Um, that's it. That, that's what it means. You can also see, I don't know if I used it. Let's see if I showed you the, let me see if I can show you in another place that I do it. No, it's well, anyway, it also happens when I wanted to take out a value of a certain player, I would also use the at before the player's map because the player's map was also uh, an atom type. Okay. Can you expand a bit more on the single and double square bracket? Oh yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, so it's good. I'm actually uh, where uh, it's, the question is uh, directed at. So over here again in this, there's like so much to talk about in this two lines of code. I know it's insane, but I, I promise once you get over all of these great, like weird things that are going on here, the, the weird syntax, and I allow myself to call this weird syntax because I love closure. So it's okay to say weird and weird is not bad. I'm, I'm weird. So, so, you know, what, once you get over the weird syntax, I promise it's so much fun. I can't tell you, I love, I love closure. Okay. I'm done. I'm done saying how much I love closure. So let's talk about the double brackets. So what we have over here, um, it's actually called destructing. If we have two, uh, two brackets, then it means that I can get only one value inserted into the pred function and then it will destruct it into key and value. I hope that makes sense. Like I will have one argument as an input, but it will be destructed into a key and a value like K and V. And that's how it's going to be called. I hope it made sense. I can't, like I'm not getting any like yes or no's. So I don't know if I need to go to dive deeper with the explanation. So uh, we can keep on talking about that. How good closure is for a database application? Like what do you mean database application? I mean, okay, in Apps Player, we have, this is the, I work at AppSlayer, like I mentioned at the beginning, and this is the main development language that we have there. And AppSlayer has many different um, databases. I hope that's what the question meant. And if not, you can ask that again. But we have many different databases that we work with every day. Uh, and also we have, we have to handle like crazy performance um, so I guess closure is both good for performance and for handling databases or I, I don't know. I hope I've got the question right. Uh, how does the performance compare to the, that to other languages? Oh, I started to mention it. Okay. Looks uh, very suited to mathematics. Yeah, I know it looks suited to mathematics. That's true. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about why AppSlayer decided to use uh, closure because you know, it's not the most popular in language in general. So why, why, why do they do that? So when AppSlayer started, um, what they, it's, it's a start, AppSlayer started as a startup. Um, mm -hmm. And what they're doing is actually, um, we are handling massive amount of data every day because we are in the mobile attribution um, field. So they started with Python and because they reached a very, very high level of requests per day, um, Python just couldn't hold it. And they had many like problems and they started checking like what other languages can be replaced, um, can replace Python. And back at the time, I think it was like eight uh, years ago, if I'm not wrong, uh, back at that time, they knew that they wanted to go with a functional language because they knew that in performance wise, it will be 
better to go with a functional uh, language because of the immutability thing. Um, and, you know, so they checked a few languages. I don't remember all of the ones that they checked, but they chose Clojure out of all of those that they uh, tested. And one of the reasons was actually because it runs on the JVM. So this is how we also get, you know, the entire, like all of the things that JVM can bring you, like all of the uh, libraries. And so you still are able to write in a functional language, which gives you better performance. But, and there is a but, okay. And I want to say another thing. For, I keep saying performance, but I didn't say how much. AppSlayer handles, I think, about 90 billion events per day. So that's, that's performance, right? That, that's a lot. So 90 billion, billion events per day. And so there are parts in AppSlayer that are being um, refactored into other languages. And we are still using Python for some things and um, for uh, mainly um, machine learning stuff. And there are parts that are being uh, refactored into Golang for different reasons. And, but still, Clojure is the main language that handles this performance. I think I said enough about it. Uh, great doc, thanks, yay. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed. If you guys have any more questions, um, you can either ask right now or really you can find me. Uh, and this is the handle of both my Twitter and my Instagram. I have uh, also my email written down. I am everywhere and I am at home and uh, I will be glad to chat with anyone who wants to talk about closure or anything else or about Star Wars. And if anybody has any more questions, then please ask. And if not, I'm gonna take the time to show you something super cool because you are here already. And I guess you can disconnect if you don't really want that. So could you please share the slides? Of course, how do I do that? Like, my, oh yeah, I'll share the slides. Maybe I'll put this, just a link in my Twitter and then everyone can take it from there. So that's what I'll do. Uh, or if somebody wants them directly to their email, they can e you can email me and I'll send it to you. So it's either uh, check out my Twitter a little later today, I'll share my slides or send me an email. And now I'm gonna show you something super cool because I have to, okay? This is, <laughs> it's out of topic, I know. <laughs> this is a toaster. <laughs> I find it hilarious. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so it's like, you can, <laughs> It's like so funny. Okay, that's it. I'm not doing any more off topic things. And if anyone, I don't think that there are any more questions. Um, I guess, okay. Uh, so I guess that that's a, that's a good night, right? <laughs> I think there's one, one question about testing. How do you go about testing? Wait, wait. Oh, I missed that. Wait, let me, let me scroll up. Okay, can you tell us about testing? What do you mean about testing? Like how do I, what do you mean about testing in general? Or do you wanna elaborate like how, about this? I guess how would you test it? Like you have a function, how would you test the function works? Um, so just like any other, I think like any other language that you will prepare the input in, in advance, and then because you know that if like, okay, if you have a function that is pure and you know that, oh yeah, unit testing. Okay, this is about unit testing. Yeah, so it's just like any other language that there, is, there are just um, frameworks uh, especially for that. And actually what I always do is I just prepare in advance the like a map with the values that I expect um to have it to have as a result and then that's it i don't remember the exact name of the unit testing which is well, not really nice because i was supposed to remember it but there there is a dedicated framework that i literally use every day and i don't remember the name but uh that's it uh i saw the test folders in your repos it's probably empty shame on me i know i did not test my own game uh it works but yeah, don't 
don't learn from me. <laughs> Test your code. <laughs> uh, blocks are also great for REPL connected editors. Ooh, uh, blocks? Oh, I use ooh, common fonts. I, I'm not sure I understand the. I'm not sure I understand the connection to what's going on here. Comment forms. Okay. Nope. What do you mean nope? Okay. I'm just reading the, the comments now. I'm not sure I get the context of everything. Anybody wants to clarify what they meant? Or no, you don't have to. Right, yeah, it's true. And the source, right. Yes. I don't know if everyone sees, and I'm just saying yes to the, to the comments. Yeah, many thanks, Naisa, yay. Has anybody here like used, I'm gonna stop sharing because I wanna see you guys. So has anybody here used Clojure or written anything in Clojure before? Yay! Nicholas, did you like it? No? Yeah? Please say you did. Yes, it was very, it was good, but just for a few toy projects, but for real applications. Yeah, okay. Every, every project is a real application, I'm just saying. No, but I know what, I know what you meant. I know what you meant. It's okay. Yeah. Um, all right. I guess uh, people are starting to leave us. But, uh, and so I think this is time for me to say good night and to thank everyone for joining again. And also thank those who activated the camera because I looked at your faces the entire time and I was checking you out to see if you're happy or not with my jokes. I laughed at my jokes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop talking now. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for joining. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Very informative. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.